The Central Committee provided the means for collective rule of the Soviet Union. One man, however, thought otherwise. After the death of Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin made clever alliances to remove his main opponent and the chief organizer of the October Revolution, Leon Trotsky. Immediately after, Stalin turned on his former allies and removed them as well. By the late 1920s, Stalin ruled unopposed. In 1928, he cancelled the new economic policy, believing that it was taking too long. Private business ownership was no more. Instead, Stalin began a series of economic measures known as five-year plans. The first such plan brought about wide-scale industrialization of labor throughout the Soviet Union. On the other hand, these drastic changes led to interruptions in food supply and caused several million deaths from famine. After the experimental mood of the 1920s and with the private enterprises gone, Stalin wanted to make a strict definition for acceptable Soviet art. These guidelines formed socialist realism, an art style which lasted for many decades. Like the older genre of social realism, socialist realism portrayed workers, farmers and soldiers, but captured them in a way to glorify their deeds and praise the ruling party. The new films were to feature characters with clearly defined morality lines and to end in predictable, optimistic ways. As the new Soviet art had to serve a purpose and be understandable by the proletariat, experimental or abstract films were no longer suitable. Still, even when confined by the rules, the Soviet filmmakers managed to create many memorable works. The industrialization movement brought another novelty to the world of Soviet cinema, the sound. The first Soviet movie made with full sound was Nikolai X Road to Life. Innovative in more than one way, the film explored complex social issues surrounding homeless children. In the early days of the Soviet Union, Nikolai, a social worker, organizes a commune for street urchins. The commune sets up shop in an abandoned monastery, making shoes and furniture. Suspicious and unruly at first, the children take pride in their work and grow fond of the commune director. The audiences were finally able to hear the voice of veteran silent film actor Nikolai Batalov. Сами ребята будем ее обслуживать. Поняли? Поняли? Opposite him is the young and expressive Ivan Kirla, a rare representation of the Mari ethnic minority. The sound recording equipment of the early 1930s left much to be desired, and Road to Life made heavy use of creative intertitles. For comedy director Boris Barnett, Outskirts was quite a bit of a departure. Set in a small town during World War I, this historical drama depicts the effect of the war on its populace. Best friends suddenly become bitter enemies. Young men leave for the trenches while the old stay to make boots for the soldiers. A young woman befriends a German war prisoner, but the other locals are not as friendly. The trench warfare is shown in a realistic manner, a hellish ordeal for both Russians and Germans alike. This once common sympathetic portrayal of Germany is most visible in outskirts, but in just a few years it would no longer be welcome. The Youth of Maxim is a rather typical film about the revolution. Quite similar to the earlier silent works of Sevolod Pudovkin, this film took advantage of sound for more intricate storytelling. The eponymous young man accidentally helps an underground revolutionary. Deaths of factory workers from unsafe conditions lead to a protest and a confrontation with the police. 
Reluctant to be an activist at first, Maxim changes his mind after many of his friends are arrested. A popular story during its time, The Youth of Maxim was followed by two sequels, The Return of Maxim and The Viborg Side. The 1930s further developed the so-called Eastern genre, a Soviet Civil War equivalent of the American Western films. Directed by the newcomer Mikhail Rom, The Thirteen is an excellent example of the type. A small team of Red Army soldiers trek through a punishing desert. When they finally reach a nearly dry well, they realize that a large force of Basmachi resistant fighters will be coming back for the water. What follows is a grueling last stand against an overwhelming enemy. Reportedly, Stalin was a fan of the American war film The Lost Patrol and wanted to see a similar Soviet picture. Curiously, the 13 then inspired another American war film, the 1943 Sahara. The year 1937 marked the 20th anniversary of the October Revolution. Previously, Sergei Eisenstein directed October to mark the 10th anniversary, and the studio expected him to have a new picture ready for the occasion. When Eisenstein ran into trouble, the sensitive task was given to the inexperienced director Mikhail Rom. With plenty of films about the revolution, but not the people behind it, this time the government wanted to see a more personal story, one about the leader of the revolution, Vladimir Lenin. Given only a few months to spare, Rome delivered a quality product. Lenin in October depicted the underground work of the future founder of the Soviet Union, his preparations for the coup d'etat, and his personal relationship with his bodyguard it's possible that the film changed some qualities of Lenin to be more in line with the socialist mythology, but it is this specific portrayal of the leader by the talented Boris Shukin, which was known to the masses, the constantly animated, energetic, yet caring for people around him, the kind old Grandpa Lenin. Konstantin Petrovich, а вам не приходилось видать Ленина? Приходилось. Какой он из себя? Unsurprisingly, the film repeats non-historical myths in its depiction of the revolution and gives a large role to Joseph Stalin, with the real organizer Leon Trotsky not seen or mentioned. Even with the socialist realism firmly dictating the acceptable elements in a film, some directors tried an unusual approach in plot and visuals. Alexander Medvedkin's Happiness is a surreal, sometimes bizarre tale of two peasants faced with adjusting to the Soviet way of life. The peasant couple work hard to grow crops. Then the various tax collectors and the clergy take it all away. Once the industrialization arrives, the wife, Anna, is quick to take advantage of it, but her husband, Khmer, is struggling behind. A remnant of the past, Khmer fails even the simple task of guarding the Soviet resources from the leftover clergy and bourgeoisie. Despite the expressionist-like imagery and abstract ideas, the film was found acceptable as it taught the socialist values to rural residents in a manner akin to a picture book. Abram Rome, director of the controversial Bed and Sofa, returned with another unorthodox love triangle. A Severe Young Man is a story taking place in a fictional communist utopia. Grisha is a perfect young communist. Physically fit, he discusses societal values with his equally perfect friends. 
Grisha is in love with Maria, a woman twice his age and the wife of a genius surgeon. He ponders whether his desire is wrong, not because Maria is married, but because he would be taking something away from a person so crucial to the society. Grisha is accompanied by his philosophical friends, the muscular Kolya is always honest and straightforward, while the animated Lisa believes that a person should satisfy their every desire. The film is wrapped in classical Greek imagery, with statues, temples and allegories to gods, not unlike the contemporary works of Leni Riefenstahl. The unusual script, timing, framing and sets create a strange, dreamlike mood. Halfway through, the film changes pace for a surreal fantasy sequence. For these and other reasons, the film was found to be straying too far from the prescribed norms and banned from release. Many years would pass before the film finally found its way to the theaters in 1974. As the 1930s continued, the government tightened control on new film releases. Some directors resorted to adapting 19th century literature, as long as it conformed to the socialist values. Butterball is a silent film based on the short story by Guy de Maupassant. A prostitute nicknamed Butterball joins a group of esteemed citizens traveling through war-torn France. Her companions despise her at first, but change their mind when Butterball is willing to share their meal with all of them. As the citizens are blocked from continuing their journey by an enemy officer, Butterball finds herself suddenly in the position to influence the fates of her fellow travelers. As it turns out, the other citizens are only nice to the defiant Butterball when it is in their interests to do so. This adaptation of an old story was a timely example to show that patriotism rules over greed and class barrier. Yakov Protazanov, one of the founding fathers of Russian cinema and a master of many genres, also adapted a 19th century story. Without a Dowry is a drama based on a play by Alexander Ostrovsky. The young Larissa is in love with Sergei, a businessman. After a brief acquaintance, Sergei leaves town for an unknown amount of time. A year later, pressured to get married, Larissa is set up with Yuli, a man of lesser means. Suddenly, Sergei comes back to town. When the two meet, Larissa is heartbroken to find that Sergei is marrying a rich woman to rescue his finances. She rejects advances of those around her, realizing that people treat her not like a person, but a thing. Like Butterball, without a diary praised human emotions over material gain. Among the many films about the October Revolution and the Russian Civil War made in the 1930s, one stood out in particular. Chepaev is a film about a famed Civil War commander, directed by two unrelated men with the same last name, Georgi Vasilyev and Sergei Vasilyev. Vasily Chepaev is an uneducated yet charismatic leader. <laughs> Быть впереди. Должен перейти в тыл своего отряда из какого-нибудь возвышенного места наблюдать всю картину боя. Иначе отряд могут обойти с фланга. Теперь. Emotional and impatient, he is contrasted by his cool and well-read political commissar Formanov. Together they must deal with an overwhelming white army force and their chances for victory are slim. The main story is complemented by a romantic subplot between Chapayev's trusty adjutant and a brave machine gunner. The so-called Vasilyev brothers spent much time gathering historical details from Chapayev's former comrades in arms. As a result, Chapayev came off as human, not perfect, but realistic and likable. The film was an instant success, with people coming to see it in droves, 
but the Vasilyevs only needed one fan. Reportedly, Joseph Stalin watched Chapayev dozens of times, occasionally even several times a week. He greatly enjoyed the idea of a film about a historical figure who was a strong military commander. Thus, the Soviet film industry had a new favorite genre. This interest in historical dramas was beneficial to the older Soviet filmmakers, some of whom had difficulty adjusting to the socialist realism standards. After the success of Chapayev, Stalin personally asked veteran director Alexander Dovzhenko to make a similar film about a Ukrainian hero. Shores was in many ways similar to Vasilyev's film. A young and clever Ukrainian medic who became commander, Nikolai Shores fights Germans in World War I, and later the Ukrainian National Army of Simon Petlura. He is assisted by Batko Bozhenko, an older man with poor discipline and an enthusiasm for alcohol, but also one who isn't afraid to speak his mind and gets the job done. A well-made film, Shores did not have the success of Chapayev, but it did make its previously little-known protagonist into a household name. Sadly, Dovzhenko's once signature surreal style is almost completely missing. In the meanwhile, the political situation in Europe was tense, and a conflict seemed imminent. Filmmakers turned to Russian historical rulers famous for repelling invaders. Peter the Great by Vladimir Petrov is a lengthy film in two parts about the renowned Russian emperor. The story follows Peter I through his acquaintance with his future wife Catherine, an uprising at a weapons plant, and various wars, including Russian victories at Poltava and Gangut. Nikolai Simonov does an excellent job in his portrayal of Peter as the tall, enthusiastic, and restless ruler. The film also explores in detail Peter's strained relationship with his son Alexei, played by the skilled Nikolai Cherkasov. Like the other historical films of the time, the society of 18th century Russia is distorted through a socialist lens. The noblemen are greedy, the clergy is cowardly, and the workers and soldiers are strong and brave. Sevalot Pudovkin and Mikhail Doller, a pair of silent film era old timers, joined the historical drama trend with their Minin and Pozharsky. The film is based on a famous historical event in the early 17th century, in which Moscow was captured by the Polish Lithuanian army. Merchant Kuzma Minin organizes and funds a Russian volunteer army, while Prince Dmitry Pozharsky leads the troops to liberate Moscow. The film is a quality production, with good actors, costumes and sets, but what stands out most is the timing of its release. Shown on November 3, 1939, the story about fighting Polish invaders came out only a month after the Soviet-German invasion of Poland. Definitely not a mere coincidence. Budovkin and Doller followed up with Suvorov, another historical drama about an accomplished Russian general. Instead of recounting the many campaigns and victories of Alexander Suvorov, the film concentrates on the events of the late 1700s. After the capture of Warsaw during the Polish uprising, the aging field marshal finds himself at odds with the new emperor, Paul I. Refusing to follow his orders, Suvorov is sentenced to exile in a remote village. Soon, the situation in Europe forces Paul to ask for Suvorov's services once again. Through decisive actions, Suvorov battles Napoleon's forces in Italy. Surrounded by the enemy, he undertakes a daring and difficult withdrawal through the Alps. Like Chapayev, Suvorov is less about history and more about the person. And unlike Minin and Pozharsky, Suvorov has time for humor. Nikolai Cherkasov is once again brilliant as the commander, in a role very different from his Alexei in Peter the Great. The shift to socialist realism was especially difficult for the man who started it all, Sergei Eisenstein. 
Que Viva Mexico, his ambitious project about the Mexican people and history, ran into trouble and had to be abandoned. It is only in 1979, well after Eisenstein's death, that the film was brought to completion. His next project, Bejin Meadow, about a young boy who betrayed his family and was killed by them as a result, was meant to be presented for the 20th anniversary of the October Revolution. As the film neared completion, the Communist Party was shocked to find out that the film strayed far from the socialist norms and presented the story using heavy biblical undertones. Bejin Meadow was cancelled and the only copy of the film was lost during the war, although a few fragments survived. Eisenstein was lucky to make it through the fiasco largely unscathed, but he was on thin ice and desperately needed to redeem himself as the genius director he once was. Eisenstein did just that with his next film, Alexander Nevsky. This historical epic about a medieval Russian hero was not only impressive in a cinematic sense, but also timely in foretelling a grim future conflict. Prince Nevsky, a seasoned commander, is asked by the citizens of Novgorod to protect them from the crusading Teutonic Knights. He prepares a clever battle plan in which the heavily armored knights alert onto the frozen Lake Papus. During the battle, the ice breaks under the enemy troops and Nevsky is victorious in defending his home from invaders. The battle cinematography by Eduard Tisse was excellent, as was the score by Sergei Prokofiev. Eisenstein did not hesitate to make an overt connection between the invading knights and the contemporary German army. From the familiar curved helmets on the comically short soldiers to the swastika-like motifs on bishops' hats, the parallels are unmistakable. And the fact that the breaking ice under the German troops was likely apocryphal hardly mattered. The film's value as a strong patriotic message was immediately obvious. However, no one realized just how soon the country would need to defend itself from a ruthless adversary. Thank you.